Praise the name of the Lord. We thank God for yet another day. We thank God for another opportunity. Shall we pray and get ourselves started? Father, we say we give you praise and we give you all the glory. And Father, for today's teaching, we commit it into your hands. And Father, I claim and I declare for all my audience, including myself, that by this word, our love, our interest will increase more and more in the accurate knowledge and also to be able to judge or make decisions that are in line with the spirit of God in us or what is done for us. And if we have that accurate knowledge, then Father, we're able to distinguish that it is excellent and that we are sincere and that we are without offense until the day of the Christ, return of Christ. And by that knowledge, we would understand that we have already filled with the fruits of righteousness, which has been given to us by Christ Jesus, to your glory and to your praise. I take authority over every negative influence of Satan by way of negative influence in our minds in the form of unpersuadableness, unyieldedness, dullness of perception, indifference, bigotry. I stifle and I deny all these satanic influences. I deny them access in our mind or I dislodge them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Thank you, Father, for utterance. Thank you for the anointing. Thank you for the glow of the Spirit, and thank you for the rainfall of the Spirit with the manifestations of the Spirit backing your word. We give you praise and we give you glory for a great time like this. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the name of the living God. Wow, once again, let me just say a, a rapturous and a thunderous welcome to today's edition of our teaching devotional today being the 3rd of September, 2020, our edition of this afternoon's teaching devotional called Epic Gnosis Daily. And once again, this is me, your host, Pastor Fred Abeka, Lady Patience Abeka, coming your way with this devotion all the way from Full Gospel Church International, the London branch, Christ Field Center. And without much ado, before I go on, the song that is playing in the background, I do not have any copyrights to it. It is just for the purpose of just playing in the background, just for our purpose of teaching, nothing further. So we have no claim to that in terms of the copyright. Praise God. Right, so get, grab your pens, grab your paper, call somebody, or get yourself ready, and let us take this journey that we've already started on continuing what is the forgiveness of sins and we are going to go into lesson number 50. 
Now, I just want you to know that, of course, I'm expecting, I'm expecting some, something, a mail. So when it comes, I'll pause momentarily, go and answer, <laughs> you know, and I'll come back. So bear with me when it gets to, to that stage. Praise the name of the living God. All right, just one quick second, and then I will just start this, and we will be zoomed off for today's teaching. Hallelujah. All right. So we are in lesson number 50 in dealing with what is the forgiveness of sins. Let's take our anchor Bible verse to start with. Luke 24, 44 to 47. Then he, Jesus, said to them, the 11, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything which has been written about me in the law of Moses and the writings of the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. He is the center, center of all. 45, then he opened their minds to help them understand the scriptures. 46, and he said, and so it is written that the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed would suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, 47, and that repentance necessary for forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. So far we said that the forgiveness of sins is based, the one that Jesus used here in Luke 24 is based on the Greek word aphesis, aphesis. And also it was the same word that was rendered forgiveness of sins in the letters of the apostles, aphesis. And that word means to take away completely such that there is no record of that sin and there is no charge to the one that has believed in that sacrifice. Then we also said that under the Old Testament, the word translated as forgiveness was atonement. And that word atonement is the word hilaskomai, hilaskomai, hilaskomai. That is the, that is the verb. And the noun was the hilastarium, which was the place or the action that the high priest did by dipping his hand into blood of the dead animal and sprinkling it to the east side of the, of the cover of the ark and to the north side. That one, that word atonement, that word atonement actually referred to what the high priest did to cover their sins. And their sins were what? The actions, the doings of sins, but not the, not the nature of sins. So in Christ, there is, they both are, are merged when we talk about forgiveness of sins. So in the aphasis, in the aphasis, we have both the hilaskomai and the aphasis put together. But the difference is that in the case of Christ, it is not to cover sins, but it is removal that allows the person now to have access to the life of Christ. So we read Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17. Therefore, it was essential that he, Jesus, had to be made like his brothers. The word brothers is Adelphos which just means that mankind, I mean, man that he made in every respect so that he might, by experience, become a merciful and faithful high priest in things relating to God. Why? To make atonement. So here he used the word atonement, hilaskomai, which is propitiation. That means that the penalty or the, the, the death, the deficit of sin, which was death, was was taken care of for the people's sin, thereby <coughs> wiping away, wiping away, wiping away, removing, and then satisfying divine justice. And when that was done, which the Old Testament people did not have, it brought what we call a reconciliation. So that means that in the post-resurrection mindset of forgiveness, three things are De demonstrated. One, he has come And unlike the Old Testament where it was to cover sins, but this one is the removal of sin nature and also the removal of the guilt. The removal of the guilt and the condemnation. Okay? It's removed. So there's, it's two in one. Then the third one will be reconciliation. Now it allows the man not only to approach God, unlike that before the law, but now it allows the person to now be united. So when a person is born again, your spirit is united, intertwined. 
it is fused with God's spirit. One, there's, there is not two spirits. And you need to get that clear. The born again man hasn't got two spirits. His born again spirit and the spirit of Christ. No, the two are one. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 7, he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Is one spirit. So we are, it's, the believer has one spirit. His spirit is the spirit of Christ and that intertwined with that of the Holy Spirit. It is very, very critical that that one is seriously understood. All right, so we said that. So we have seen forgiveness of sins before the law, Genesis chapter 3 to Exodus chapter 12, where the sacrifice was only because they, so that they could approach God and have right privileges, but not that they had their sin removed or they had the spirit of God inside them. Then when we came to the law, the same thing, but this time more conditions were attached. More conditions were attached. They had to confess their sins. And you realize that in Genesis 3 to Exodus 12, nobody confessed their sins. Nobody confessed their sins. They just did a sacrifice. However, in the law, under the law, they had to confess their sins. It was a requirement. The reason why the confession was made at that time was so that they would be conscious or be aware that there's something wrong with their nature. It was required. It was required that they confess their sins, they do sacrifice, they pray, and they turn away from their sin. And there were conditions. Then we have also seen in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that it was still an extension under the law, according to Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. When the fullness of time was come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law born under the law. Christ was born under the law. So that is why there were some things that were still requirements under Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But he, Jesus himself, in dealing with individuals or groups of people in his healing or in his preaching, never required anybody to confess sins. He rather said, your sins have forgiven you. So we also said that because of this understanding of forgiveness of sins, Paul prayed a certain prayer or groups of prayers, which are spirit-filled prayers that every born-again believer should pray in addition to their other prayer requests. And these prayers, to make us understand further the forgiveness of sins, are found in Ephesians chapter 1, 15 to 21. If I was you, I would note it, because some of you still have not been able to go to the YouTube channel to see this. So write it down and start practicing it. Ephesians chapter 1, it's on your screens right now, these are the prayers that Paul prayed. Ephesians chapter 1, 15 to 21. It was recorded of all prayers that the apostles prayed. These were the prayers that were recorded. That means that it bears significance. Ephesians chapter 1, 15 to 21. And I told you that I started to pray these prayers. Then my understanding opened up. It was until I started to pray these prayers. In addition to my my, my <laughs> serious or, or voluptuous study of the epistles that my understanding opened because the understanding was there already, but I could not see. I was following it like everybody else. But Paul said he prays that the eyes of the understanding may be enlightened. Ephesians 1, 15 to 21. Ephesians 3, 16 to 19. Colossians chapter 1, 9 to 12. Philippians chapter 1, 9 to 11. Let me go right again. Ephesians chapter 1, 15 to 21. This should be your daily prayer. And then when you are praying it and you come to the place where the subject is you, you change it to me or you put your name there. And you, you say it. After you say it, you speak in tongues. I'm telling you, you will see how your growth, your spiritual growth will go like that. All of a sudden, the Bible will come alive. I submit to you that if you are struggling to understand the things of God, that's why Paul prayed this prayer because he realized that the church in Ephesus, the church in Colossae, the church in Philippi, they were struggling to, to grasp the concept. And Paul could not be there every day. So also I cannot be there every day. I'm not in your houses. But this, the Holy Spirit will take care of that. Take these ones and start praying them seriously every day. I am telling you, your understanding will open like that. 
because the thing is there, but you are not seeing it. Any concept I drop or the apostles drop, you will not struggle to accept it. If we say salvation is eternal, there will be a witness in your spirit that is true. When I say we don't need symbols, we don't need the elements. All elements have been, have been supplanted by Christ. Whether it is anointing oil, whether it's even communion, whatever it is, all has been, all has been replaced. Christ has replaced all of them. You will not struggle. And when we come to explain them, you will just take it easy. But when this eyes of the understanding is not open, no matter the teaching, you will still struggle. Until I started praying these prayers, all of a sudden, when I get into the, the mature understanding of the things of God, I don't struggle. I just, there's a witness in my spirit that that is it. And I can also, also see where when somebody talks, he has gone off course and there's error. It will bear witness, I'll know. So Ephesians chapter 1, 15 to 21, Ephesians chapter 3, 16 to 19, Colossians chapter 1, 9 to 12, Philippians chapter 1, 9 to 11. Very, very, very important. In addition to your studying of the epistles. All right. Then there's also this one as well. Philemon, he said, I pray, verse 6, it's only one chapter, that the sharing of your faith may become effective and powerful because of your accurate knowledge of every good thing, which is ours, is for us in Christ. So the common denominator in all these prayers that Apostle Paul prayed for the churches, here, all these Ephesians 1, Ephesians 3, Colossians 1, Philippians 1, and Philemon 1, the common denominator he prayed was for accurate knowledge, showing that that is all that the born-again man needs. That means that the born-again man is fully supplied. Everything is in his spirit. Every, everything about your life. You don't lack anything. There's nothing wrong with you. There is nothing wrong with you. You don't have generational curses. Nothing. It's just that you don't know or you don't know how to operate. You don't know how to operate it. So this will show you how to operate it and give you the ability. So the common denominator that Paul identified was accurate knowledge called epignosis, referring to the explanations of all that Jesus did for us in the letters of Paul and the other apostles. He calls it epignosis. So the epignosis is the explanation of the message, the why of the message, the how of the message, and the when of the message. Praise God. All right. For those who just came to join, I'm expecting a, a mail. So when it comes, I'll pause momentarily and I'll go and collect it and I'll come back. So don't, don't worry about that. All right. So let's go on. We have talked about so many. So we, now you know what the epignosis is. You know what the keruguma, okay? So the message of what Christ did to sin nature through his crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and seating or sitting at the right hand of the Father is known as the kerugma or the preaching of Christ. So it's not just somebody, it's not just somebody saying that, oh, when you, when you, when you go to their church, you are preaching Jesus. That's not what it's known. It's not just mentioning Jesus, Jesus. Because there are many people doing that. They are just, in their preaching, they are mentioning Jesus. But that they are not referring to what he did, which is a benefit to us. They just mentioned Jesus. Some also, they just mentioned the epistles in passing to sound relevant. But when you listen carefully, they are not saying anything about the epistles and what we have received from Christ. Then they go off into Old Testament. Now, it's fine. If you go into the Old Testament and you are able to link it to what Christ did, that's fine. But if you go into the Old Testament and you separate it as if now Christ is coming to do something or is yet to do something, then you are in error. Because all the apostles always did was that they linked the Old Testament to the fulfillment of the prophecy of Christ. That is how you teach the Old Testament. I'll come to that again next week. So that is what we call the preaching of Christ. The full explanations are found in the epistles. It is called epignosis. And the epignosis are the full disclosure, the full revelation of God in Christ. Nothing more, nothing less. <laughs> God's full mind and character is fully exposed, disclosed in the way Christ did the following things, what he did to them, what he dealt with them, how he dealt with this, sin and sin nature. 
the consequences of sin, spiritual death, eternal death, mortality, giving all of himself as an inheritance to the one that believes, sharing full partnership with the one that has believed on him. He demonstrated this in his pre-planned administration over sin, including his rule over it for the believer. And that's what we read in Romans chapter 8, 28 to 39. I'll not read it again. You can go over it again. So that is very clear. All right, so moving on. How, do you now see, do you now see why when Jesus resurrected, he said that forgiveness of sins should be preached as a message. Look at the expansiveness. We are in lesson 50, 50 of the forgiveness of sins. <laughs> so by this track record in the epistles with reference to pieces of evidence from the scriptures. When I use scriptures, I'm referring to Genesis to Malachi. When I come to the gospels, I'll say the gospels. When I come to the epistles, I'll say epistles. I don't call the epistles scriptures. I've trained myself like that. It's, or if you want to use scriptures to mean Genesis to, to Revelation, that's up to you. But technically, that is not right. If you meet, if you meet a Jew and you use the word scriptures, he was, his mind goes to Genesis to Malachi. Okay? So, by this track record in the epistles, with reference to pieces of evidence from the scriptures, we have proof of God's true nature demonstrated in his keenness. That's what we ended with yesterday. His keenness to eradicate sin nature and its consequences for, for man as a proof of his love to be united with man. So we saw his keenness in foreknowledge. He planned it already, already. Keenness in love, planned already. Keen in a desire to save, planned already before he created the world. Keen desire to share all of himself, all he has of himself. He planned it already, long time, long time. That, that blo I don't know about you, but that, that blows my mind, you know. That blows my mind. Because when he was forming Adam, the word form there is bara. When he was forming Adam, he knew the man would go his own way. <laughs> but he did it in love. <laughs> See, we human beings, we can't, our mind can't grasp it. Our mind can't grasp it. Our mind cannot grasp it. This knowing of God in Christ doesn't preclude that means that he has not said that he already chosen some people. There's a teaching going on like that. It is erroneous. No. They call it universalism. It is not universalism. And it does not exclude anyone. He has left it open. Through the, 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 the entrance is by the message, the preaching of the message. Now, this is everything about him laid bare. What he did to sin and the three days and three nights, the resurrection, and giving of himself all to man, that means there's no hidden agenda about God. No other side of God to fear. No other aspects. Just hold on, please. I need to, I need to collect the meal. Just one second, please. Okay, no. Sorry about that. All right, let's go on. Right. So let me go back over that again. No hidden agenda. No other side of God to fear. I don't know if you hear people, they say, hey, you know, you are, you are God for granted. Be very, very careful. What? That is so petty. What is that? No other aspects of him that we are yet to see. Nothing surprises God. Picture that to free you when he was creating Adam, he knew the man would go his own way. But he was laughing. He was laughing. You see, you, you, have, you and I, because we are in the flesh and our nature, originally we grew up under the nature of Adam, which is selfishness and evil. Now that we have come into Christ, we are now trying to grow in the love of Christ. Even that one, there are, there are percentages of selfishness still. Still. So we are not able to see because if it was left to you and oh, you and I alone, ha! <laughs> that is humanistic love. 
That is why our mind cannot grasp it. When he was forming Adam, he knew that Adam was going to go. But he had a plan already. He had a plan. That is why when he came to the garden, he said, Adam, where are you? The voice was not a voice of, I'm going to kill you. Adam, what's up? It's like, what's up? <laughs> you know, he was the one that took, killed an animal and covered, covered their nakedness. Why didn't he wipe them out instantly? He had a plan. So that through this gracious act of him in Christ, we see a display of the highest and deepest revelation of God in Christ. No wonder Paul prayed those prayers in Ephesians and Ephesians chapter. Until you have a revelation of this, you will be looking elsewhere, which leads to deception. I'm going to read the Bible verse. Look at this. Paul prayed that prayer already in Colossians chapter 1, that they will be filled with this knowledge. Now look at what happens when knowledge is absent. When this understanding is absent, when a believer, any believer, has not understood what I'm sharing, what for 50 lessons about the image of sins. Look at the result. Colossians chapter 3, verse 8 to 23. Watch and listen. Takes you captive through philosophy. What is philosophy? If, if you break Philio and Sophia, the word Philio means a lover, a fan. Or an amateur of what is Sophia? Sophia is, is knowledge. What kind of knowledge is he talking about? It's it, it just the, the general interest in, in knowledge. This knowledge has come through our educational systems. This knowledge has come through societal environment. This knowledge has come through family traditions, you know, or your personal reading of books, newspaper, you know, that is that. Now, in, in this area of knowledge, some have advanced. So, for example, in our university, if you've got lecturers, they have, they have advanced in a certain area of, of Sophia, relating to a certain field. And when they advance, they think that that is the only knowledge that is there. So when you bring the gospel, it doesn't make sense. Then they will try and use academia to try and say that the Bible is not true. Or how, it doesn't make sense. How is it that when I'm in Christ, I don't need to confess my sins? Because when I come in Christ, I have got an overdraft facility. Forgiveness is given as a gift because he's our advocate. It was forgiveness was under the law that to bring them the consciousness of sin. But in Christ, sin has been removed. He's not going to charge you to account. So what are you confessing? Because his, his presence in you is the continual forgiveness of sins. Philosophy will not understand it. Because you are, you are using your mind to calculate. That, uh, but how? 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 So when I do anything, when I, how? 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 That's philosophy. He said, see to it that no one, and what is the result of that? Because they have not understood what we are teaching. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception. What is that empty deception? Look at the parenthesis. Pseudo-intellectual bubble. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I love it. It means that a, a talk, talking, that sounds intellectual. Now, what is the meaning of the word intellectual? The word intellectual is taken from the word intelligent. The word intelligent is from the word intelligentsia. The word intelligentsia means gather information. So some people, they have gone to gather information in a certain area, maybe in an area of, let's say, theology or maybe let's say mathematics or science or physics or chemistry, you know, or microbiology, whatever it is. And then they, when they gather that knowledge, then they think that the Bible is also human knowledge. They don't know it's revelation. So when they, when they come, they try and twist, you see, using what they have mastered in to make it look like what Jesus Christ did it's not true, or what we are saying, it can be. And it happens, it happens to many, many even believers like that. So he calls that pseudo. It looks, it looks intelligent. It looks like, ah, this man, he has, he has knowledge. They use, they can even use rhyming words. Rhyming words. They'll use rhyming words to sound clever. 
He said, but that knowledge, what is it, what, what is it according to? It's according to the tradition and musings of mere men. So it is a based on what was handed down, the way they've done it. That is why when you come and say, for example, that, for example, the believer does not need to confess his sins. They say, huh? But we have been doing it in church. The fact that it has been done for years does not mean it's right. They have forgotten something. They are just copying from the Old Testament. And, I'll, and I'm going to deal with that next week. When we go to the first John, we'll see that there was nowhere else it was written. That thing was taken from the Old Testament. So it, is that, it sounds clever. According to the tradition and musings of mere men, following the elementary principles of this world. Did you see that? It is it's knowledge based on this world. Rather than, look at that, rather than, rather than, rather than following the truth. What is the truth? That word truth means reality. What is reality? Accomplished fact. What is the accomplished fact? What God did in Christ to sin. He calls that the teachings of Christ. We come back to the same word. Kerugma. <laughs> see? You see? You see that? When that word is not, when that kerugma is not understood, you now turn to what? Pseudo, <laughs> let me use that word, I love it. Pseudo intellectual bubble which is according to tradition. They've been doing it. They are just doing it, but they are not asking questions. Why? Why are we doing this? Why are we supposed to do this? We are just following. It says that rather than the truth, stay with the Keruguma. Why? Verse 9, 4, or since in him, in, in him Christ, all the fullness, if you understand the Keruguma, you realize that everything has been given to the believer. So there is no generational curse. He doesn't lack anything. He just lacks understanding of this. That's why I said that. See to it. See to it. I'm telling you, I went to a certain meeting years ago. The way the man came to preach the word, afterwards, I felt like I was not born again. Ha! Hey! The man, the man, and the man is a PhD holder, but he's a minister of the gospel. The way the man used some words and some things, I wondered whether I was born again. That's what he's talking about. He's not staying with the Keruguma. He's adding his own. He says that, for in him the, all the fullness of deity, the God that dwells in, in bodily form, completely, look at, look at words. I want you to, that's why I'm, watch the words, completely expressing the divine essence of God. Look at verse 10. Oh, ye boko tayaba katayaba. And in him, you, hey, lebo sataya. You have been made, not going to be made. You have been made, not going to be made. You have been made complete. But they will make you think that you are not complete. They will come. I, heard, I even heard somebody came to, when he mounted the pulpit, he said, yes, uh, Colossians chapter 1, 13 and 14 is true. But as for you, in your case, it is different. What is that? Trying to tell the person that, yes, even though it is, yes, then I also heard another man say that, yes, it is truly recorded that Christ has died for your sins, but experientially, no. He confused the people, saying that even though you are in Christ, you can still have generational cares. You see that? In him, you have been made complete. You don't like anything, but Satan is lying to you. Sometimes it can be true wrong teaching through your own mindset, through pseudo-intellectual bubble. <laughs> it sounds good. And because some believers, they don't know what I'm, we do, they don't know that dividing line. They think every preaching is preaching. But the way the man is gyrating and sweating, ah, he can't be wrong. He can't be wrong. That's what you think. And in him, you have been made. That's why the epistles are key. You see the epistles, when you know this, he said, you have been made complete. Achieving spiritual stature through Christ, and He is the head over all rule and authority of every angelic and earthly power. Stay with the person. Yesterday, a pastor friend of mine sent me a, a text, and he said that he, yes, he knows that we, the believer is not supposed to confess their sins. Da, 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 but you know, a certain man wrote a certain book and said, "Send me the book. Let me see." Then, when after I read the book, I saw where the man missed it. He's a very famous man. I won't mention his name. I saw where the man missed. It. I told him, "Listen." He is not the final authority. The epistles are the final authority. Stay with the epistles. Stay with the epistles. Once again, stay with your epistles. 
stay, you'll be safe. There was no way Paul said what the man said. There was no way Peter said it. Stay. The, the man has added his own. He said, in him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision. So the circumcision they did under the Old Testament was a type of the proper one that would be done not to the foreskin of the male genitalia, but to the spirit of man that had Adam's nature. In him, verse 11, you were, look at the terms, past tense, you were, you were, you were, you were also circumcised with a circumcision, not made with hands, but by the spiritual circumcision of Christ in the stripping of, of the body of flesh, the sinful carnal nature is removed. Hey, so if it is not there, what are you confessing? If it is not there, what are you confessing? Having been, been buried with him in baptism, this is not water baptism, it means that incorporated and raised with, did you see, did you see, buried with, with, were you there when he was buried? Was I there when he was buried? So this is talking about what we call identification. The law of identification. We are identical when you believe. He credits you to as if you went through the same process. When Christ was buried in the mind of God, you were buried for sin. Hey, the word with is the Greek language sukatizo. You cannot see one without the other. Identical of the same parentage, of the same status, of the same lineage, of the same womb. Hey having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him sukatizo, with to a new life through your faith in the working of God as displayed when he raised Christ from the dead. Look, he's giving you the facts. Why? Because in Colossians, the same problem was faced as we face today. You hear all this good teaching. Then you go and hear on radio and television. Someone will come and stand. But be very, my prayer for you that you make it on the last day, then he has thrown dust in your eye. Then you say, ah, wait, hang on. And the guy can come with patches of Bible verses that are not stringed together. That's why he's giving this fact, because some guys came to Colosse and started throwing dust into their eyes again. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, worldliness, manner of life, he calls flesh the life in Adam. So flesh in context is not this. God made you alive. Look at that. God made you alive together with Sukatizu. Were you there when Christ was made alive? He's talking about identification. Having freely forgiven us all our sins. 14. I don't know if you are reading with me on the screen. These are lovely facts. Serious facts. This is our salvation. This is what he did for us. These are things you must hold dear. 14. Having cancelled out the certificate of death do you know what the certificate of death was it was when adam sinned and he sold himself over to satan satan was making a voice called guilty of death that voice was in every person's spirit that is why when the person does not know jesus and he dies demons will come and make demand and say this one is mine because there's a sentence of death in his spirit, in his nature. He said, having canceled the certificate of death, what was the debt? What do we owe? We owe death, death, because of the sin of Adam. For the wages of sin is death. Having canceled out the certificate of death, this was the man that received Christ, consisting of legal demands, because the law confirmed that which were in force against us and which were hostile. And this certificate is set aside. And are you seeing the, the language? This is not journalism. He's not, he's not occupying space. And completely removed. Wait, and this certificate he has set aside and completely removed by nailing it to the cross. So he tells us something. He's saying the word nailing to the cross is a metaphor. Not that physically we saw it on the cross. No. What he meant was that, what he meant was that, that was the thing 
that thing, the Adamic nature and the law, was what gave Satan power over the entire human race. It is like having a very bad tooth. So long as that tooth is in your mouth and it's bad, your head will throb. Your head will throb with pain. Your whole head is banging. Bam, 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 bam. Even though it is only one tooth. Until the dentist removes it, then you are free. That night you will sleep sound. So the same sore thumb was Adam's sin nature. Hey. And Satan was using it to reign champion. That is why he said that, verse 15, when he had disarmed, disarmed, so it, there was an arm. It's like, it's like a nuclear bomb in films like James Bond. They say that the bomb has been armed, activated. So he disactivated it. When they said James Bond disactivated it, that means that he took out the component that allows it to explode. He disengaged it. And in the film, you can see the counting down. You know, the, the, the seconds are counting, are counting down. Everybody's at the edge of their seat in the cinema hall. Oh, is it going to explode? Oh, is it going to explode? And the man with, with such cool as a cucumber, with such dexterity, would take his time with pinpoint accuracy, disengage the blue wire, disengage the red wire, disengage the black wire, and disengage the device. Then da -da 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 -da, the thing does not explode. That is what he did. He, he disengaged the ticking time bomb. The ticking time bomb was Adam's sin nature, Malula Kataya. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, those supernatural forces of evil operating against us, this is their epignosis. He made a public example. That means that they saw that they had nothing else to stand on, exhibiting them as captives in his triumphal procession, having triumphed over them through the cross, because it was on the cross that Jesus was made sin. So the one that Satan was standing on to have control over any man has been removed. Have you seen how Satan has deceived up all these years? That even though you are born again, Satan has got something again, hold against you. Now lie. There it is. Once you are born again, there is nothing of Satan over you. Let me give you an example. After the abolition of the slave trade in 1874, Makata Batuta Yabaya, when Abraham Lincoln had announced the emancipation of the slaves, Rabataya, news had not traveled. So there were still some slaves who were still working for their slave master. Because that time, communication was not like today, whereby a touch of a button, I can send information simultaneously. Word had to go by word of mouth. They were free. But many did not know that they were free. And the slave masters, they were wise. They knew that Abraham Lincoln had announced it. But he would not tell the slave. And he would still keep the slave there. And let the slave work for years. It's the same thing. It's the same thing now. You don't know that you are free. Satan won't tell you. He will still dominate you and make you think that there is something wrong with you. Satan, Satan's most preferred approach is to make you doubt yourself. It's to make you think that there is something wrong with you. Hey, did he do it to Eve? Did he not do it to Eve? Did God say that you may not eat of any of the trees in the garden? Look at how he phrased the question. Look at that. Already God said you may freely eat all but one. But he phrased it in a way and saw that Eve didn't know her rights. Look at Eve, Eve Mrs. Eve. Look at her mistake. She said, oh, he said, we may freely eat of all, but the tree that is in the middle, we may not touch nor eat. Touch was not part of the instruction. Then Satan said, boy, I'm in business. She doesn't even know. Satan twisted it, but she didn't know. And the same thing he does, somebody can come and twist, this I'm teaching you right now, can twist it, twist. 
you will know. If you don't know it very well, that is why I said, pray that the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened. Know the epistles for yourself. They are the explanation of what we have in Christ. If you know it, when somebody twists them, you say, hey, 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 hey. there is nowhere Paul said that. That is it. He disarmed them, but he wants you to think that he has not been disarmed. How does he do that? Pressure. Satan uses pressure because in pressure, you cannot think. You have forgotten all Bible verses under pressure. He's telling us about the Kerugma. So he's saying that if you understand all this, because what the guys have come, is now what I'm going to explain. I, I'll tell you that if you don't understand the Kerugma of the epignosis or the epignosis of the Kerugma and what the apostles did, what Jesus did, then this is what you now turn to some things. I see what Jesus did is not enough. Look at the verse 16 of the Colossians chapter 3. Therefore, let no one judge you in regard to food and drink. Food and drink is not what qualifies us to go to heaven or to be born again. No. It is not food and heaven, food and drink that went to hell. And I said, I'll come to that. For so many years, they have used communion to scare people. And I'll come to that. I think next week I'll be dealing with that when I finish with the epistles. So many years. Because they have looked at one verse and one line that they have, they have twisted it upside down. Ah, uh, said, so let no man judge you. Regard to food and drink. Look at the next one. In other words, men who want, who want performance, outward things to show that now they're born again. And this has dominated the church for long. But he's saying that no, salvation is a work of Christ alone and alone. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Mundane things is not what gives you the password. It's what Christ did. That's what he's saying. And you receive it by faith. Whether you eat or drink does not change anything. Jesus Christ said it in Matthew. He said what goes into a man is not what defiles him, but what comes out of him. What comes out of him is his nature in Adam. Therefore, let no one judge you in regard to food and drink or in regard to observe, observance of a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. He said, look, all this, you see, you see, what you see, look at the 17. Such things, what things? Let's go back. What things? Food. What was the food he was referring to? <laughs> huh? What was the food he was referring to in context? He was referring to, he was referring to the, what we call the communion. That's the food and drink. Because that was what they practiced as Passover. I'll come to that. People are confused between Passover and Agape Feast. In that 1 Corinthians chapter 11, when they say breaking bread, it is no communion. It is love feast, Agape Feast. We'll come to it. We'll come to that. He said, let no man judge you in food or drink. These were ritualistic food and drink. Whether it's the Passover, whether it was anything, that does not what we qualify. He's going to explain why. Because all of them, whether it is that a festival, atonement, uh, ye compor, whatever it is. He said, what, well, verse 17, such things are only a shadow. Do you, do you understand what the word shadow? The word shadow there in the Greek is skia. S-K-I-A, skia. It means an outline. An allegory pointing to something. It, were, it was a symbol. He said, such things, such actions are only a shadow of what is to come. And they have only symbolic value. Oh, Christian, can't you see the words there? They are only for symbols and a typology of what Christ will do to sin. Then he goes to the verse 18. He said, the reality of what is foreshadowed belongs to Christ. All those things that were been under the Old Testament and all those practices of Passover, all of them, it referred to one man. Didn't Jesus say it in Luke 24? All the writings of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms referring to me in typology. I have come, those things have no place anymore. I have come to take its place in its fullness. And that's why, that's why I'm teaching this. Until you understand this, you will be looking to elements. It will look like what Jesus did is not sufficient. You will be looking to things, things which were used to point to Christ. It's like traveling to Manchester. And when you're traveling to Manchester, you come to the sign, sign, sign post or the signboard. 
and then you park your car and you take selfie telling people I'm in Manchester. Then somebody sends you a message. Oh, Pastor Fred, that is the sign, just the signboard. You are not in Manchester yet. It's pointing you to Manchester. Then I say, no, I'm in Manchester. Ah, what are you saying? I'm in Manchester. Can't you see? I'm in Manchester. See this, Manchester. Um, no, they think something's going cuckoo. Something's wrong. You have not entered yet. You are this, you're on the way. So those things were symbols, signposts. The real, the, the, when you get to Manchester, do you need the signpost to prove you're in Manchester? You don't need a signpost. You just take pictures and say, I'm in Manchester. You are in the real, you don't need a signpost. He said, because of this lack of understanding of what Christ has done, look at what he says, verse 18. Let no one defraud. Do you understand the word defraud? It's a very serious word Paul is using here. Do you understand the word defraud? Let no one defraud you of your prize. Your freedom in Christ, which is your salvation. And how do they do that? They insist on mock humility. Everybody kneel down, kneel down. Everybody kneel down. So they kneel down, kneel down, kneel down. If you don't kneel down, the angel will not visit you. Jesus is passing this way. Kneel down. Your blessing is not coming. That's mock, 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 mock humility. And the worship of angels, they place emphasis on angelic, angelic visitation. Ha! And I'm not saying that these things don't appear in our meetings. Yes, but they are not the major. They are not the major. Jesus is superior to angels. If I'm preaching and angels appear or not, fine, I'll preach the message. But I'm not going to a meeting looking for angels to appear. And he said, they, these people, they insist on mock humility. They insist on worship of angels. Meanwhile, Hebrews chapter 1 has said that Jesus has inherited a name superior to angels. And then he said that they go into details about visions. Uh -huh. As for this one, we have a lot of it. Why visions? He claims he has seen to justify his authority. Because if I come and tell you that I saw a vision of Jesus with 10 angels, you have no way to verify it. Once I say it, I have disarmed you. Because there's no way to prove it. There is no, I'm saying there is no way to prove it. I can come and say, uh-huh, uh, uh, epignosis saints. Yesterday night, I had a vision. And a vision, Jesus appeared to me. And when he appeared to me, he said, my son, my son, my son, I'm taking you places. And I saw three angels. How can you verify that? <laughs> How can you verify? You can't verify. He said, these people, that is their emphasis. They want to take you away from the kerugma. The facts are more important than the visions. As important as they are. Now, don't get me wrong. There's the manifestation. But he wants you to know him by the facts. Because angel or no angel, vision or no vision, your sins are forgiven. I don't need to wait on that. He said these people, they go into detail about visions. He claims he has seen to justify his authority. Puff up. In conceit by his unspiritual mind. Look at look at the next one. And not holding fast to the head. You know the head, Christ. What he means by not holding fast to the head is not attached. What is Christ? Christ is the central teaching. What he did in salvation is the central teaching. So what they are saying, they are not saying it linked to what Jesus did to the believer. They are saying it outside. As if they, they'll say the Bible is not complete. Yeah, then they'll even quote this one in the book of John. And the Bible says that if all the things that Jesus did were supposed to be recorded in the, the books, it will not even fill all the volumes of the book. He, he has quoted it out of context. He's not saying that, Jesus did not mean that by saying that, you know, that there's some more revelation. No, but he said that, but these ones have been written, that you may know that Jesus is the son of God, that he, that he gives life. These ones are enough. The extra ones, we don't need them. If you have not even finished the 66 books, you have not even understood the 66. Let me even leave the 66. You have not even finished the understanding the epistles. Why do you need those ones? So they are not holding. They are not connecting. They are not connecting to Jesus' explanation after resurrection. That's the head. The head means the originator of the explanation of the Bible, of the body, Jesus Christ, from whom the entire body supplied and knit together by its joints and ligaments grows with the good that can only come from God. So he's saying that growth is more important to God in your understanding of what he has done. So he goes on, if you have died with Christ, I love Paul. I love Paul. Thank God for Paul. 
thank God for Apostle Paul. I said, thank God for Apostle Paul that he gave himself to this. If you have died with Christ to the elemental principles of the world, why, as if you are still living in the world, do you submit to rules and regulations such as do not handle this? Hey, no, 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 do not taste, do not even touch. These things all perish with use in accordance with the commandments and teaching of men. These practices of men trying to achieve that there's something in it, indeed have appearance, they look, they look cool. They look cool on the outside. You know, today we are going to do feet washing and then they'll bring they'll, all the choirs wear robe. The whole thing looks solemn. You know, they'll bring cameras. Then they say, hey, this is very spiritual. Wow, they are washing the feet, you know. Meanwhile, the apostles never did that. That was done under the law based on something that Jesus did. But it has become popular. Everybody's doing it. Now, on the day that they do it, they do something like a, 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 a particular anniversary. They say, now we are going to now, we are now going to wash everybody's feet. So that the thing looks spiritual. They say, now we are going to do anointing service. Meanwhile, the anointer, it lives inside you. Paul, them didn't do anointing service. They know that they have the fullness. He said, these practices indeed have the appearance, the populace of that of wisdom, a self-made religion, and mock humility, and severe treatment of the body, asceticism, but are of no value against sinful indulgence or the nature of sin. Those things didn't go and take sin out because they do not honor God. That means that God even didn't want them. Those things that the Israel did in the Old Testament, he said, for he said that the blood of bulls and goats, he did not require. They were just to go to the motion temporarily. Mm, let me end here because next week, I'm going to now start with forgiveness of sins as taught in the epistles by the Apostle Paul. This is where the problem is. That if we don't stay with the syllabus, and you keep on me here, me out here, I'll say it until you get on that bandwagon. If you have not started reading the epistles, you better start. You better start. I'm telling you, the peace and the joy you will get even. The eyes of your understanding will be open. I mean, the Christian life will be more smoother. Why do you want to reinvent the wheel? It has been written for you by Paul. You yourself will see that, ah, so why didn't I see this all this time? <laughs> it, it, has, it has been there all, all the time. Goodness me. All these practices. And let me say, and I'll, I say it boldly without apology. And I say it boldly without mentioning anybody's name. And I say it not in there because I was there myself. There is not a single of any of the fiscal so-called customs that we do that adds to anything that Christ has done. Whether it is from tithing to whether it is from none of it. All has been represented in Christ. Don't you understand? What Christ has done is sufficient enough. We read it. He said, there are traditions of men. They just follow. They just went through the motions. And when that thing happens, you, it makes you take your eye off the real deal, the real McCoy, the real McCoy is what he did in Christ that is for you. Your mind is taken from it. So when your mind is taken from it, it looks like Christianity is not sufficient. What Jesus did is not sufficient. There is something wrong with me. There's something wrong with me. There's something wrong with me. I am not complete. I don't know. I don't know whether I'll make it. Look at the confusion. Terrazzo, it unsettles you. I don't know. Hey, we can never know. We will never know. We can never know. We will never know until we get to heaven. Oh, no. Meanwhile, you have settled all of it here already. It's in the epistles. It's in the epistles. That's why he said in Colossians chapter 1 that to wait, which was a mystery in the past, but now has been revealed, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The hope of glory is what? The glory is his spirit in you. It was a hope for the Old Testament people. They were hoping for it. They were hoping. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, ah, they looked to that day. They looked for a city whose foundations and maker is God. They were looking for that day. Hebrews chapter 11 says that all these people of the Old Testament, as we're looking, they all died without receiving the promise. But we, 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 together with them, have been made perfect. They were looking to that hope. We are the ones that have it. We are the ones that have it. 
the fullness of the spirit. And I'll say it, there's nothing wrong with you. Don't let anybody deceive you. It's just that you don't know how to use your authority or you don't understand your authority or you don't understand what Christ has done. That's just probably the problem. That's why you need to study the word and listen to teachings. There is nothing wrong with you. There is nothing chasing you. There is no curse after you. If things are going wrong, maybe it might just be simple things. You no, know, I remember when I used to I used to work years ago. You know, I had a problem because I came with Ghanaian mentality into a British working mindset. It was not that there was anything following me. It was Ghanaian mindset that was messing me up in my work until I acclimatized to the British mindset. And my sister used to laugh at me. She said, you are not still acclimatized. You are still holding on to Ghana. <laughs> And probably that might just be a small adjustment. There's nothing wrong with you. Let no one deceive you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. In Jesus' name we shall continue. Amen. Bala, 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 bala. All right. Before any question, or I'll, 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 let's, tomorrow is question day, so probably I'll not take any question. If you have any question, maybe you want to bring it in tomorrow. I want to remind everybody, please, tomorrow we have last, we are starting the first maiden one. Well, we, we did a bit partially last week, but proper maiden one is tomorrow. Question time. A few people have forwarded, have forwarded their questions, okay? And so we're going to deal with that and probably other questions as well. And because of this, I want it to be more interesting and lively. I will have one extra panel, one extra panel and, or invited guest to be with me so that we enjoy, like, you know, like, you know, you go, when they do question and answer, you know, they have a panel, you know, so that, you know, we, we, we do it all together nicely. So it will not be like, oh, it's, it's only me, Pastor Fred, that is saying it. So I've got one guest. We have a guest minister of the gospel who will join me every Friday. One of them, you know, I'll, I'll rotate them like that, who will be with me. He might take the first part of the question, when it finishes, I also add my voice, we'll do it like that, we'll tag, we'll tag question, we'll tag answer the questions as it were. So still if your questions are not in, we still have up to today by midnight to send in your questions, and then tomorrow we are here and we'll deal with the question, so that we ha we'll have that. When, the, when we finish that, I'll deal with the written or the, well, the written questions that have been sent already first, and if there's time, I'll open the floor for random questions that will, will come in. I also will ask you questions. <laughs> but I need to make sure that all that I've talked so far, you also understand. Amen. Let me take this opportunity and thank Sister Ruth. Thank you very, very, very much. Thank you, Sister Nina. Bless you, bless you, bless you. Thank you, Brother Elisha. Hey, that's my man. That's my man. That's my man. Elisha, man, the ministry is going to explode in your hands over there, wherever you are, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. You are receiving some truths. Amen. Guard it jealously. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Sister Vivian. Bless you, bless you, bless you. Oh, Sister Sherry. Hey, Sister Sherry. Bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you. And Sister Jennifer. Bless you, bless you. And of course, oh, I think there was um, Sister Rosemary as well that was there. I, I don't think there was Sister Angela. And also there was one other person. Have a lovely, lovely, lovely day. We are back with prayer this evening. And also I thank Lady Patience for backing me. I love you guys. You are the best with the love of God. Adios. And see you. Bye for now. Bye, bye, bye. Bye. Uh, hey, Sister Vivian. <laughs> bye, bye, bye. Oh, bless you, Sister Sherry. Bless you, bless you, bless you. Bye, bye, bye.